What's happening, everybody? Welcome to Courtside Fracas, episode two, a uh, new basketball podcast from the Touchline Media Group discussing all things NBA. It's myself, Yassine James, hosting. This week, I am joined by Harold, hot take Harold. What's good? Hello, brother. How you doing, man? All good. I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to what the hot take is this week after <laughs> I might not make it last week. Yeah, yeah, it's coming. Don't worry. But at least you, at least you look right. At least you look correct, you know? Thank you, thank you. Uh, Nii, what's going on, mate? How you doing? Yo, 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 I'm good, man. What's good? Everything's good, mate. Basketball's flying. Everything's good. This you, what's good, man? I'm good, I'm good. How you guys? Not bad, not bad. Uh, listen, last night, big game uh, between the Dallas Mavericks and the Milwaukee Bucks. Went to overtime, Mavs with the win. But the real sort of fallout from that has been the topic of Luka Doncic, Giannis Antetokounmpo, Sort of varied discussions around that. Uh, a bit more nuanced than who's the better player. Things like who would you build your franchise around? Who is going to be the face of the NBA for the next few years post post LeBron? That's kind of been discussed with both these players from very very early on in their time in the NBA. And just because it seems to be dominating the internet a little bit, uh, I just wanted to get some people's thoughts. So Luca or Giannis, where are we standing? It's definitely Giannis for sure, in my opinion. I mean, like on this week. I think you put up the vote this week and people just kept banging on about Luca maybe being like a top five player all time, top five player right now. And I don't get it because like no top five player ever has been that bad defensively. I mean, like you've got to play both sides of the game. Like, I mean, he's a great offensive weapon, yeah. But if you can't play defense and your team effectively hides you like a traffic cone, you're just not cutting it. Like, you can't do that. Yeah. So, Would the argument to that be, though, that he's in his second year in the league is something he could improve on? I mean, that's fine then, but I mean, then he's not better than Yanis. That's all, like, you just can't compare them. Yeah, he's a good player with a lot of potential. He's probably going to be like, he's, I mean, he's obviously going to be like an MVP in the future. He's a star now. But I mean, he's just not on Yanis' level right now, to be honest. Well, well, that's a good point that you've made about the whole MVP rivalry in the first place. Will he ever get an MVP? If Is it that clear cut where with Yanis in the league only, what, four years older? Mm. Will he ever get an MVP or will it just be do dominated by Yanis the entire time he's in the league? Um, I think he'll definitely get an MVP because um he's got, I mean, he's got everything. He's got the highlights which people love. Um, he's got like that star presence. Um, um he's European as well. I guess so he's got he's kind of got that flair. And like, when people that can score like that, and people love to reward on the offensive side of the game. So when it comes to MVP, if that has ever come, maybe like a top three seed, or maybe even that like, first or second, then I'm I'm pretty sure he'll get an MVP one day. See, the thing for me, I think he just needs to. Oh, you guys hear me? Yeah, yeah. I, think, I think for me, he just needs to have more games like yesterday. I don't know if you guys have seen the game, but he was clinical. 24, 14 or 19. Yeah, just do that. I mean, yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. Not, not, not even in regards to, obviously, the ridiculous numbers, which I might say, these, him getting more rebounds than, than uh, Paul Zingis is, is a bit, is a bit uh, dodgy in my eyes. I can't lie. I but, don't know if you can call that dodgy with Bissu here, mate, because he's he's modelling himself off someone else there. Oh, Ross. Hey, no, no, <laughs> even no, Adams, no. get out of the way. <laughs> even Adams, get out of the way. You should, bro. What's, what's, what's he going to do with the ball? <laughs> no, but it's more... Luka, of... let, him, let, let him start the offence from the... <laughs> yeah, the ball. Yeah, I respect Luca for that. <laughs> for me, I think it's more of just him being more clutch in, in those moments. So, at, at the end of the fourth, he normally... He, I don't want to say normally, but he has, an, he has a tendency to go, go missing in the fourth. And that's been the case this year, hence why they've got, they've got so many L's. Um, yesterday, however, he turned up. So many dimes to Paul Zingis, so many clutch threes. It was, it was brilliant. That's the kind of performance that I think separates you from others, and that's what Nii was probably alluding to in the fact that he will get... Well, yeah, on, on, on that one, just to paint a picture, I think... Uh... They were they were chasing the game late in the fourth and even in the maps and then even in overtime there was about a, a one minute sequence where it went little through the leg pass time for yeah, for, uh, for a bit yeah big, that was crazy. Uh, then he got a key rebound there um, was essentially boxed out still got his hands to it uh, and then a little floater just went down the other end and got a little floater so that that has been the criticism of him but it's a sophomore season so again I think the I think the Debate is a difficult one because of where they are in the league. Janis is at the very top of his game so far, um, really adjusted to the NBA. Luca though, has played professionally since he was about 16, 17. Yeah. So you can't call him a, a young player in the same vein as like a Trey Young or, <laughs> or a Zion or someone. But looking at last night, you've got 36, 14, 19, as was alluded to, and a plus 12 
on the floor. Now, I'm not a huge plus minus guy, but Jan is minus 16. One <laughs> assist, 14 rebounds. So I just, I think it's just put a spotlight on it with the head to head. And I guess a bigger question is just, this year, I know you have a thought on this. If you were to build around one of them for the next five years, who would, who would your pick for that be? Um, I'll pick Yanis. Like, obviously, yesterday, um, they lost, um, I think, but Yanis played 10 minutes less. So if he played 10 minutes more, maybe he sat loud have been better. I'm not, that one assist is a bit nuts. But I think that's one thing Yanis needs to improve on. His, um, his actual playmaking, he's got, it's got a lot better. But um, when defence gets really tight, especially when there's no transition, he isn't as good of a passer. Definitely nowhere near Luka Doncic. Luka Doncic is clearly more skilled. Like, when you watch him, his footwork is insane. How he gets to the basket, even though he's not incredibly quick, mm. it's crazy. He gets a basket whenever he wants. But as a boy said, like on defense, he's like open Wi Fi, bruv. Like people just go past him, like <laughs> no tomorrow. So I'll, I'll think the reason I've got around Yanis is because you can't teach seven foot. He's seven foot and fast. <laughs> he's seven foot, fast, strong, can jump. He takes three steps from the three point line and he's at the rim. And like this is a guy who's putting up like 30 points. Like 12 to 13 rebounds, about five, six assists, and he's putting it efficiently as well. So, for me, when you have somebody who is elite, almost elite, I don't know, you have to call him elite. If you're scoring 30 points a game, you're elite offensively, as well as elite defensively. He's an MVP, he's the front runner of MVP. I think he might be the front runner for defensive player of the year. Yeah, he is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he's 26. Yeah. Like, come he's on, fam. Like, he's yeah. true to the name, he's true to the name. Yeah, um, Obi, we're just going over what's happening, mate. Only a, only a little bit later than Disu, so he did all right, to be fair. <laughs> but uh, we're, we're just going over uh, Giannis or Luca. I'm going to come to you for your 10 pence in a second. Um, one one of the stat line that did concern me, and it's a bit of a theme for Giannis Disu, is his percentage from three last night was 14%, essentially, 14 points. Yeah, his three-point three um, stroke is so slow. It's so weird. He's yeah, gone like, worse. It's mm, gone worse. Mm, mm. <laughs> Don't, don't we see like a crane lifting up bare bricks like that? <laughs> <laughs> not, he, he lets off bricks straight after. But um, I think that's something that he he has worked on. Mm-hmm. Is getting better. But I think it, even if he just becomes an okay three point shooter, that yeah. opens up so much for him. So if it's not if it's something where, he, uh, if we leave Yanis, he can he might knock it down because Luca nobody's gonna leave Luca open from three. But Luca's only shooting like thirty one percent from yeah, three, yeah. even though he shoots like game. But then again, like five of them will be step backs. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So like, if if he gets like a decent three point um, stroke, he's he's really over now. But it's gonna be so so difficult. Guys. So like oh, the wow. Toronto series that we saw last year, that don't happen when Kawhi's like, I'm not letting you get to the rim, and you're not gonna get easy free throws. So what are you gonna do? So mm-hmm. that will change things for him. Or maybe if he really improves his playmaking, that will open things up for him even more. But or maybe after, if Bledsoe and- decided to play some basketball as well, that that might. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, let's go. Yes, sir. When it gets to playoffs, bro, you can't trust any of these youths, man. <laughs> and that's the one guy you don't want in your clutch, man. Well, yeah. well, this is the thing. You want to talk about help as well. Janice is, is doing a lot without much help. Okay, Middleton puts up good numbers, but yeah. And the system may be designed for him, but you are relying on on players that are being maximised, it looks like, by Budnaza. Um, Just the last little word there on, on Janice Dissu, for you in particular, as a as a recent... Rockets aficionado uh, included yeah. in the trade package with Russell Westbrook. Yeah, they, they put me and Russell. I don't realize that it wasn't it wasn't just a trade for Russ. It was a trade for Disu as well. It was, it was big news that shattered the streets of Lagos. You get me when they had that. <laughs> the Rockets as well. So, so considering, I'm surprised that you're on the uh, on the uh, seven foot is enough, and not the James Harden argument of I wish I was seven foot and didn't have to learn to play as well. Oh, no, 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 no. When it comes to Harden, Yanis, like Harden's better than Yanis for me, like because. Of what Harden could do on a basketball floor is just absurd. And I agree with Harden the fact that he's he's a lot more skilled than Yanis. But I think he he was taking a piss of Yanis. Yanis a lot more skilled than that. But um with Rockets and the way they play, I actually I actually think it's very smart. The problem is I think they need somebody a bit bigger than PJ Tucker, because he's six five. Like, mm-hmm. six, seven, like who was it? It was even the, the Bucks. Brook Lopez was putting man Brook Lopez Nurkic. Like, down low looking like <laughs> Hakeem blood, like it was crazy. So, <laughs> so if you had like, cause I think I was saying in the group chat that if you look, even look at the Warriors, when the Warriors play, um, they forget starting fights. It's about who ends the game. That's mm. what who's yeah. your closing yeah. lineup. Yeah. And Zaza, Pachulia ain't in their closing lineup or any of these man. It's Draymond, Iggy, before obviously Durant, um, um and uh, Splash Bros. and Draymond six seven. So if you have somebody who's maybe six seven, a bit more taller, that can actually 
be maybe only two inches or two or three inches shorter than your big men, then I think the Rockets' style okay. of play can actually be even more effective because you have to guard their three-pointers and it opens up the lanes for Russ and Harden to do their thing. But yeah, I hear, I hear Harden on the, on the Yanis thing, but he took it too far. Yanis is, Yanis is unreal. And then and last word, last word, Obi. Handle. What's that, Dizzy? And Yanis has got a pretty good handle as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And like, like you said, he only needs to take three steps. So as long yeah. as that handle is efficient enough for, for that, then, then he's good. Uh, Obi, last little word. If you were to build a franchise tomorrow around Doncic, Yanis, who are you taking? Uh, I love Doncic, but it's got to be Yanis for me, only because I think they're both effective on the scoring end, uh, but Yanis takes it defensively. So I'll take that over Doncic and his playmaking, oh, even though he's a player. Cool. He's also uh, Nigerian, so yeah. It's true, though. Well, this is the thing. Well. You know but he what? changed his last name, innit? So. Listen, that <laughs> last name thing has thrown me, and I swear, I talk to people all the time who don't know this. Yanis Antetokounmpo is not called Antetokounmpo. They Greeked him up. Yeah. They Eurocentricked him up. <laughs> the, white man, the white man took his name. Bam. And, like, and there doesn't seem to be any point made of this, ever. Like, the, at 18, they were just like, here's a Greek passport. Yeah, yeah, it's a new name. Don't worry. It's close enough. It's close enough. But uh, the, whole time, the whole time I didn't know this, I was thinking, how's he got a Greek name? Because I've seen his parent, I've seen his mom, like, seen his brother. Like, what's going on here? But, yeah, like, I don't know. In, in, in light of the next topic we're going to talk about, it might have to just be Giannis added the combo whenever we discuss him on this pod um just just on a quick one it's something we didn't touch on with the first pod just because we were going through the teams and obviously wanted to give everyone an overshot of everybody um anyone who has tuned into the nba coverage as of, as of late will have noticed that there has been a huge emphasis um on the backdrop of the social situation in America, which is obviously replicated and, and seen through solidarity in a lot of the world, um, on police brutality disproportionately against against black people, against black males, black females. Um, and it's easy to forget now that it's all kind of moved along so smoothly that at one point, COVID aside, there was an issue about restarting by players on this topic. It was in the in the real midst of the post George Floyd murder, demonstrations, protests, whatever you like to call them. Um, and you, you saw a lot of discussions and leaks coming from players that it wasn't just about health. There was a real concern that bringing back something like the NBA might actually be detrimental to that cause and might actually distract and quieten issues of, of that nature. Um, so, I mean, the NBA, to their credit, seem to have done their bit. Um, probably more so than a lot of a lot of sports have. Like we use the Premier League as an example. Obviously, there was the Black Lives Matter um, bits on shirts and the kneeling before a first uh, a, the whistle for kickoff. But NBA have probably gone a bit and beyond. They've uh, bla emblazoned every court that we've seen with Black Lives Matter at the top, very visible throughout the entire game. Obviously, they've um, approved 29 messages for the back of jerseys, which replaced where player names would be, including things. Uh, that they range. I think some of them, I know there was some some sort of speak out from players would have preferred something a bit less restrictive, but some of them like listen to us, say their names, justice now, how many more are quite powerful messages. Um, players, again, were involved in a lot of those demonstrations and protests, have taken it upon themselves to mention people like George Floyd and Breonna Taylor in interviews whenever they're asked basketball related questions. So there has been a lot done. Um, I guess my, my thing is, has there been enough done and were some of the players who had reservations right in that actually bringing back the sport may have been inadvertently quiet and some of that discussion? What, what's your take on that, boy? I think he's right, to be honest. I think Kyrie was right. Like, not that it would be like a... Um, like, no one's doing this on purpose, but just the fact that there's sport on every day, you do forget about these other issues because your mind is elsewhere. I think a lot of the reason why uh, the Black Lives Matters protests were so prominent was because a lot of people didn't have anything else to do, like in terms of like working or watching sport or other stuff like that. People couldn't go out, so they had free time to go and do protests and demonstrations and whatnot. And I think the fact that now a lot of people are going to be inside watching basketball, naturally, it's going to take the focus off of Black Lives Matter a little bit. Whether or not uh, that's going to be damaging to the cause as it is, I think that's we're yet to see. Yeah, I think it's a bit of a it's a bit of a weird one because 
I think, and I always, I think, I did it last week as well. I, I commend Adam Silva on, on what, and what he does as a commissioner. I think he's, I think he's fantastic. And I like how, um, like, unashamed they are to show that they are pro Black Lives Matter. On the court, back of the shirts, kneeling before games, coaches, referees are like, all, literally everyone. I love all of it. I think naturally, it will, like Obi said, it will take away from a little bit from the, from the, the, the message that all the players and the, the coaches are trying to construe. However, not, not to say both can't be done. So I know there's games every day and, and whatnot, but if your focus is, is on change, like, the, like some of the players, like we spoke on certain players speaking out. So for instance, Tobias Harris came out and said, um, today will be a great day to arrest the, the killers of Bri- Breonna Taylor, something like that. So it can still be done. And that's not necessarily, it will take away it to an extent. However, I don't feel like we can use that as a, as an alibi or, or as an excuse to not continue the, the push. Um, but, but perhaps I'm just speaking as a, as a selfish uh, NBA fan. You know, I, I really enjoy the sport of basketball. So perhaps I'm, I'm thinking like that. Um, yeah, that's about it. Um, I think it's a good point, experience like, to continue from what Obi said. Um, I wouldn't be harsh and say like what the NBA doing is lip service because it's not. I think they're doing a good job with um, like putting the word out there. But um, I think what Kyrie was also like, talking on was like reflection. And obviously, and when you're playing basketball and you're putting a lot of energy into your basketball and these players are about to play playoffs as well. So, I mean, like you don't really have that much time to do that much outside of basketball yeah. when all your energy and focus goes towards like winning that championship or playing the next, next team or whatnot. And just like the fans in general. Um, like, and when you wake up and like, especially me, I wake up, I look, and there's like six games that I can watch that day. It just kind of takes away your time from reflecting on things that need to be reformed or done. And I think that's what Kyrie was speaking on. Not that basketball shouldn't be played, but that maybe this was a great time, especially in lockdown, for people to sit at home and reflect on what they actually want to change instead of the same things that they want to change, but how we can go about and reform that. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah. This is just coming to you, mate. Uh, I'm going to tap into Disinomics a little bit, if that's all right. Um, the NBA have done something which I think we maybe take for granted because a lot of football clubs and Premier League, they all have charitable foundations that does a lot of sort of grassroots work anyway. But the NBA have come out and said that in um, collaboration with the MPBA, the National Basketball Players Association, MPBA, um, they're going to release $300 million. Uh, the owners of, of teams and the NBA, it will be $1 million per team every year for the next 10 years. Now, the this is pretty groundbreaking there because ne- there's never been anything approaching an NBA foundation previously or anything like that. And allegedly, the onus is mainly going to be on sort of three key areas. It's going to be obtaining a first job, securing employment, following high school or college, career advancement. But there's also going to be a little... It's a bit vague, and, and as charitable organisations do, they kind of say things, and then it's all about the detail. But there will be more of an effort to look at community work and systemic issues and and everything like that. Just as someone who I know is is well versed in sort of economics and social impact and everything like that, it sounds like a lot of money. But with it being employment based for young black males and young black people in communities who are already kind of at that point of 18, 19. Will it look like a drop in the ocean and not really address any of the systemic issues that are are more damaging? Or is it sort of the best you can expect from an organisation like this? Um, I think think it's very helpful because a lot of people's issues stem from economics in the first place. Mm -hmm. So if you can get yourself into a sound economic situation, you're going to be able to not only have a decent life, but also create a decent life for your family and friends. And if many people in your community are like that, you're going to uplift your community as a whole. However, what the main issue is, what has brought people to protest is police brutality and systematic racism, which doesn't, it doesn't care about if you've got money or not. For example, LeBron James, one of the most recognisable athletes of all time, a gazillionaire, probably, do you know what I mean? The guy's signed like a lifetime bill of Nike, probably worth like a billion dollars. Somebody sprayed, spray paint a racial slur on his on his house. Like, so if LeBron's gonna get it, and he's like super established, clean resume, c- celebrity athlete, it, anyone can have it. See what I'm saying? So economics doesn't doesn't generally protect you from everything. See what I'm saying? So 
what um what I do believe I understand the NBA. I think is a uh, is a very groundbreaking thing that you've actually three hundred million is not it's not small money. That's a lot of money that you because remember people need to remember this is money they don't, they don't have to give away. Mm. Just billions doesn't mean you have to give away millions. Like some of us make thousands, we don't want to give away random fifty pound notes. Like I know I don't. <laughs> do you know what I mean? I just want to give somebody for no reason. But um, I do feel like with interest in terms of like a lot of the owners are billionaires with some of the interest politically as well is going to be very very difficult to get them to actually come out and say yo there's systematic issues we're going to address them because some of those systematic issues is what propelled them to their position in the first place so it's 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 better than i expected but it's probably not what the people want people want to be, and to be fair, what NBA has done in the compromise, maybe not a compromise, but I'm not sure if you boys have picked up on it. It was just like the broadcasting like from ESPN, ABC, TNT. They will actually talk on these issues mm. and they'll be quite stern on them. And then you maybe like Doc Rivers or coaches. We know the players are not talking about it, but hearing like Mike Breen and Doris Burke um, speak on these issues does, I think that that does have some form of impact. So the NBA is definitely way ahead of the NFL, but... I don't know, man. Well, this is this is the thing. I mean, even even this time around, won't won't uh, delve into end zone fracas coming soon uh, mm. too much. But the NFL were even forced to sort of look at themselves a little bit with an apology. I don't know how how much you can really read into that. But when you do compare the leagues, one hundred percent, I think the NBA reaction and and commitment to it has been huge, um, and especially in America. But I think your point there is an amazing one: is that you can do all the awareness. Um, on the coverage, which has been brilliant. I think most timeouts, there's a, a video message as well. Um, you can do all of that, but at the end of the day, you've still got people like Trump saying, yeah, no, I'll turn it off. So it's an interesting one that, it's, it's, I mean, I don't have the answers. It's, it's just sort of commentary on it, but for the NBA to uplift people within a systemically racist society doesn't seem to do much for those doing the oppressive acts and having the oppressive attitudes and everything like that. So it would be interesting what they do in maybe communities where racism is more of a problem, not just for people suffering, but also the people perpetrating. So I think that's an interesting one that may be being overlooked. Um, but generally, as sports go, how, how do you feel they've, they've tried their best to, to combat it, everyone? Uh, I would say just in sports in general, I think it would be, my goodness, I think it would be a catastrophe to, for most American sports, if not, if not British, um, if, if they didn't give any sort of acknowledgement to the issue at hand. I mean, I, I was saying before, I was jokingly saying to my friends, I was like, I would love to see just, a, just one game week of basketball where there's no black players playing. I would just love to see what it would look like. It would be, it would be hilarious to see, to see some, of the, some of the quality of basketball in the league. Our best players are black, like, it's, like in, in a lot of sports, you know? So I think it would, it's, it's outrageous for at least one, if they, if they don't agree with the message, um, to not at least go ahead with it because, boy, there'll be an outcry. Um, but on a more pressing point in regards to how have they done, I think they've done all right. Um, I think NBA have done very well, as I expected from Adam Silva, like I said. NFL, I mean, I'm not even going to speak on them because, boy, yeah. Yeah, they are, they are down in the dirt, to say the least. Uh, Premier League have done, have done all right as well. I think a lot, the players mm. have done a lot themselves, mm. um, which I'm really impressed. I'm not too, I'm not too impressed with the FA um, or anything like that. Um, yeah, I'm, I say NBA have done all right, man. I think there's always things that you can improve on. Like you spoke earlier about saying they could have um, spoken to certain players to have, perhaps a bit more, a bit less restriction on the names they want on their back. So LeBron James, for instance, only has LeBron James in the back of his shirt because he wasn't involved with Chris Paul and, and the, the MBPA and picking the names on the back and et cetera. When the players, I think the, the, everyone should have just picked exactly what they wanted. They're, they're just no, no swear words, just say something like that. Just keep it clean. There's no reason why anyone could have anything they want. I think that you could, you could argue that, but that's, that's me maybe nitpicking. So yeah. That's Sorry to start the time, but someone on Twitter said, Gordon Hayward was going hard at anybody with equality in the back of their shirt, and I was <laughs> tired. Oh my god! I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Oh His shirt god. is vague as well. His shirt says education reform. That's not really something to do with like. Well, well this <laughs> is the thing. Like, I, I saw that debate come out about Hayward, and it was like education reform, and he got a bit of shit for it. And then the counter argument was, "Oh, well, other people." I think Marcus Morris is another one I saw with that. 
just, I mean, he hasn't spoken on it, I guess, to, to give I him the credit. He does it, I don't think it's wrong. I, I don't think people understand how, sorry to cut you off, in that no, no, no. terrible educational system is in certain black communities. It's horrendous. Like, the, um, the state of the schools, the budgets that they're given or lack of, like, the state of equipment and resources and books and the expectations, like, is terrible. So, like, that's a very, that's, a, that's a, one of the key, most key points. Like, if you do not have a good educational system, how could you have any hope of social mobility? So, I think, I think it's crazy from killing Gordon Hayward, but them saying that he was trying to give people with equating about buckets, I'm sorry, I was in tears. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Especially because he was playing poor after him back from his injury early in the season. He, yeah, he's, been, he's, he's, been, <laughs> he's been on a slow uptick, but he, he has a guy had a good bubble. So whatever you want to put that down to, well. I don't know. I don't know what um, listen, the mullet, it looks a bit... Well, this is what I was going to say. He's, he's gone with <laughs> like a moustache look, yeah. which isn't helping the image. <laughs> 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 like 1890 slow mode, I can't kind of no, uh, Do you know what? When it's edited, maybe we put up a little photo of that because it's, it's not... Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it doesn't help him in these jokes. Let's put it that way. <laughs> I like Gordon, man. They need to leave, they need to leave him alone, man. But, uh, listen, he's been kneeling. He, he's been doing his thing. Unlike certain, I think, first game, uh, Celtics Bucks, there was a referee who, like, this is the thing where you can yeah. do all this work. And then there was just at the end of it, Budenhauser, Stevens, arms linked, everybody kneeling, as has been the practice for a lot of games, all players, all coaching staff. And then you just look to the left. Mm. And there's one of the three officials who were there on the knee just stood up. Standing like, proud as well. No yeah. shame. Proud. Yeah. And it's like... What, what's his name? Didn't nearly either, innit? Uh, Jonathan Isaac. Isaac. Yeah. yeah. And, then well, actually, yeah. Uh, and then got to... You know what? <laughs> Obviously, uh, he's, he's left my mind a little bit because Isaac has got an injury. He sort of yeah. his cruciate and he's out of the rest of the bubble. But that... <laughs> that surgery went well, uh, by the way. Huh? Because he's, he, he's, his surgery went well. Don't by care. The way. Good for him. Nice <laughs> one. But yeah, I mean, well, there's another topic. You've got a player coming out and obviously he came from a very religious point of view and may, he spoke to people and he got guidance on it, maybe missed the point slightly, but he basically went full, all lives matter on it. Um, was there anyone who sympathised at all or, or not? You know what, yeah, I can't lie. Um, I'm not, um, I don't like just the completely, utterly annihilated people because they have a different point of view. Of the all lives matter bit or anything all lives matter he does make me sick I can't lie <laughs> but it wasn't like he was completely well like so when people do all lives matter their intent is usually to completely and utterly circumvent the discussion at hand yeah I don't think he was doing that I do think his stance was weird I do think his explanation makes little to no sense waffle but, man yeah that's what I thought personally but I don't think like he deserves a cooking and really and truly at the end of the day I can't lie I'm a bit controversial on this all these men weren't kneeling two, three years ago. So, True. like, they asked them when they're going to kneel, and all of them, like, when Kaepernick was doing it in 2017, and they all, none of them kneeled. So, all this, okay, we're going to cut this guy for not kneeling. All these men, all LeBron and them, man. Mm. Also, LeBron said, no, I'm not going to kneel. It's safe, so safety, safety in numbers, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's what it is. When I saw LeBron say, even though I'm a big LeBron fan, when I saw LeBron say, I hope Cap's proud of us, I wanted to vomit. I was like, bro, <laughs> two years ago. <laughs> That's yeah. typical LeBron, though, isn't it? I love the <laughs> guys, man. I love LeBron so much. That guy is so shameless. He's so a PR merchant. Yeah. <laughs> PR James, man. Yeah, man. Face the NBA. He's on his way to the MVP, bro. He makes it. But, yeah, I mean, that's, it's a big topic. I think we'll, we'll see how that M, uh, MBPA foundation looks. Uh, hopefully that comes to something really good. I think that could be the most significant outcome um, of this also. Hopefully that goes well. I think we'll move on back more to, to the games themselves now. And I think this is something with so much happening in the NBA and so many games and so much going on between our weekly pods. Um, I think you could lose yourself a little bit. So I, I, we're going to ask everyone sort of courtside focus to the week a little bit. Um, you can focus this on player trends later down the line it can be trades drafts whatever it is um but even me for example i was thinking of, of talking about the miami heat and or as i'm gonna call them today the miami misfits looking at some of their roster and how well they're doing there compared to elsewhere but then they've just gone one and four in the week so it's like or one and three in the week so it's it's, it's, it's hard it's hard to keep up completely um I, i'll kick us off in that I think I was, I was, it was tough for me to, to decide on a, on a focus. Um, it was going to be the, the Miami Misfits in terms of just how well and how good people like Duncan Robinson and Jay Crowder and even Kelly Olenek, uh, Olenek are looking. Um, they've just been a lot of fun, but they, they have lost some tight games. They run the Raptors really close, run the Bucks really close, bullied my Celtics. 
Um, so they're, they're still looking like that. This is a lot is without Butler, who's got a sore ankle as well. They are still looking like a really tough playoff matchup. Um, also, the playing, like we were talking about last, only last week, it was Grizzlies v. Who as the eighth seed, and now the Grizzlies have gone what, one and four. Yeah. Uh, Blazers are on fire pretty much across the bubble. Suns five and oh coming into the conversation. Spurs looking really, really good. Um, so the Grizzlies might not even have a point to making that play in. They might not even make that. Um, what I do want to focus on, I guess, is uh, is the Celtics as my as my focus of the week because I think you really saw two sides of the Celtics. And before sort of our playoff prediction and previews next week is it straight away put me wondering where they're going to be as a team. Um, they got battered by Miami. Uh, it was almost a recipe of how to beat the Celtics. It was aggression from Miami, second chance points when the Celtics aren't great on defensive rebounding and threes, which the Celtics allow a lot of. So if a team gets hot, it's like, oh, well, that's what they do. Mm -hmm. um, Marcus Smart fouled out, which is rare for him. Usually the most reliable guy on the court defensively for the Celtics. Tatum playing with five fouls. Miami just physically just washed them a little bit. Um, no, it's them, not us when we lose. Uh, and then zone defense, <laughs> zone defense as well. The, the Celtics, as I touched on last week, they've got a lot of good players that are really rounded. And you talk about Rockets' philosophy and small ball and everything like that. The Celtics one seems to be really versatile wing players who are decent size, can contribute all aspects of the floor both ways. But then when it comes to someone getting hot and having a real star breakout game, uh, it's a problem, but also when you go zone defense and we, we lack a real ISO player, it's a problem too. Um, Kyrie, for example, last year would have been great against that. Kemba's not the same player in terms of just getting his way to the rim. It's good, but not he Kyrie. He used to be, level. though. Huh? He used to be. And, and for, for Charlotte, he used to, he used to, he used Listen, to get to the right Charlotte, player. he was just, here's the ball, do what do you want. want. Yeah, well, yeah. Well, I think with us, is just... He's, he's good, but he's not Kyrie level. So when we come yeah. up against someone who's really locked in, um, I think the size issue comes a little bit and he's good. But Tatum's not quite an ISO player. Jalen Brown's handle is getting better every year, but not quite there. Um, but then, like I said, a week's a long time. And then only the other day, we've, we've gone and we've outplayed, out-hustled and outscored Toronto with ease. I've uh, never seen Raptors look that bad on defence. Mate, but we like they didn't look great, but we had them absolutely locked up. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. Kudos to you guys. Yeah, absolutely. Dave Brown had Siakam with nothing really. Uh, we were able to switch Hayward and Tatum onto him really well. Um, Rob Williams, who's been a bit of a whether he can contribute or not uh, in a good game, came on had a really really good game with points, rebounds, and and clever defense. Didn't get sucked in by pump fakes too much. Um, and that's that's the difference for us. I think whether we move the ball well, 27 assists in that game compared to 15 against Miami, and whether we actually focus on the on the defensive end because we just don't really have the size to to take a night off and rely on a Gobert or an Embiid or or anything like that. And I think people last week said the Sixers were one of the lowest floors and the highest ceilings. I almost felt like the Celtics are down that route as well. When they're on it, they can play anyone. Um, but when they start games slow, as we seem to do with Brad Stevens a lot, without much initial changes or anything like that, they can they can really just get a hide in early and never recover. Also, Gordon Hayward will be leaving um, pretty much from the second round because he's leaving for the birth of his son or daughter and probably not coming back. Um, so, yeah, uh, I, I have more questions than answers with the Celtics after the bubble. We still don't really have a, a locked-in rotation. Um, we don't have size, but when we're on it, we're one of the best teams in the NBA. So I have no idea how we're going to look moving forward. And these Miami and Toronto games, two potential playoff opponents, have really, really shown that. Uh, also, shout out Jaden Brown for getting snubbed for most improved player because I agree. Snubbed. The guy gets no respect. But anyway, that's 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 been my real takeaway <laughs> for the for the week. Uh, does anyone else want to lead on on what their main NBA focus has been? Yes, 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 I do. In the I words stink. of one of my favourite <laughs> Fabrizio Romano, here we go. The mm -hmm. LA Lakers. Are you listening, guys, yeah? Oh, so, we clinched, so we clinched number one seed against Jazz, yeah? Okay, well done. Good job. We're down two to four in the bubble, okay? Most recently coming up against Michael Jordan. Oh, sorry, I mean, TJ Warren and <laughs> the Lakers. Yeah? <laughs> 
No, but on, on, on a more serious note, okay. So LeBron James went 31, 8 and 7 yesterday. That's his best game since coming back in the bubble. Um, AD. AD has been, uh, he's been, he's been giving me some sleepless nights. Um, let me tell you, he's, he's scoring since he's been in the bubble, okay, guys? So, and by the way, I know LeBron hasn't been the best in the bubble, but he's LeBron James and in the playoffs, he's a different player. Okay, anyway. AD. So he went 34 and then 14. He went 42 and then 9. And then he went 17, and last night he went 8. He scored 8 points on 35 minutes. 3 from 14 shooting, guys. Yeah? He, is, he, is, he has played the most inconsistent ball I've ever seen him play. What did you, what did you, what did you put the, that shooting struggle down to? Were they defending him in a particular way? So, with AD, he's as um, Dishy spoken it. Well, Dishy, yes, he's spoken it in our group chat yesterday, and he was saying how he shared a link from Draymond, who said... Him and Embiid is is another one of those players who, if you give them the ball and the paint, no one's really stopping them. And AD has been keen to show he's not just a big man. You know, we have that kind of thing in football, I think. You know, I I, I don't want to put too many analogies down to football, but a big man who has got a bit more about them than just... He seems really hesitant to play centre. He seems to hate centre. He's like, no, I'm forward. I don't want to be a centre. Yeah, he is because he feels like his skill set is that bit more to where he can offer a bit more outside of just the paint. You know what I mean? So that's what it's been down to. He, I think it's just been down to a very poor shot and very poor shot choice. Also, he, he's, he's, he's putting up shots when, when he's being double teamed. It doesn't, I don't really understand why he's, he's doing this when there's a free man, but his free man is Dion Waiters. So I guess I kind of understand. So <laughs> it's, it's, looking, it's looking tight at the moment, but he's, he's one story, but one, he's not even my main issue. It's the role players. Yeah. So we have shot 25% from the three in the bubble. That is the worst in every, every team in the bubble. We shot 39% um, overall. That is the worst of teams in the bubble. KCP and Danny Green are shooting 25% from the three. Yeah. Yes. Caruso, Caruso is playing decent basketball, <laughs> a, a decent defense. He's shooting 11% from the three. Guys, are you hearing what I'm saying? About this? Sniper. I am absolutely <laughs> dying. Markeith Morris is missing open freeze. I can't even believe I'm saying this. The only person who can put their head up is Carl Kuzma. He's the only player that's actually played some decent basketball in this bubble. We look so poor. And the worst part is, we are naturally not a good shooting team. So in the league, we're, 23, we're 23rd in the overall, so post, um, pre-pandemic um, from three. And then we're 28th in the league for, three, for free throws. Wow. So we're naturally terrible at shooting. What, what has made us as good as we are is our, our, our defensive efficiency. I think we've, we're ranked third pre, pre-pandemic. We've been so poor, so poor um, in this bubble. I, it's almost made me forget that how they even got as many wins as they did. So that's what my main worry is. And aside from that, as well as people missing open threes, people missing open shots, it's outrageous. Do you, do you, we, think, do you think you'll be able to fill, uh, flip the switch once the playoffs start? Or does it concern yeah, you about how inconsistent it is? It concerns me because... I get we punched number one seed, and these games are basically giveaways now. But you don't want to go into the playoffs on bad form. You'd mm. ideally be playing well. So it's not you can't just. I, can, I don't want to just assume that players can just flip the switch. Not everyone is LeBron James. Not everyone is James Harden. You can have a bad night and just go and go up and turn up and, and and drop fifty on them or something. Like you just not everyone is that skilled. And unfortunately, unfortunately, we've seen it of our team. Our role players just aren't of that level. It's actually it's actually quite worrying, to be honest with you. We just. And obviously, it's looking more likely that we're going to get Portland in the first round. And we've already predicted that Portland are going to cause us tr- problems. And I predict they'll at least get two games from us. Mm. So it's looking like it might be even more. It might go down to all seven. So unless, deficient, unless our def- um, defensive deficiencies improve and people start dropping open looks, honestly, I don't see anything, anything past the Clippers. Like, honestly, can I ask, that's can I even if we're lucky. Yeah, go ahead. Is, there, is anyone here confident that the Lakers make it to the finals? No. I'm not if they play the Rockets, no way. Nah. Oh, oh also, sorry, I've got something else to say as well. So the Lakers dropped 111 points yesterday. Um, and I brought their average of points in the bubble so far to 100.8. Yeah? That, before the game, they were the only team in the bubble to be shooting below 100 points in the whole of the bubble. 
guys. The Washington Wizards are in the bubble. <laughs> <laughs> what is going on? I can't on? believe how prominent the Wizards have been on this podcast. Like, <laughs> oh we, my we, god! We said that they shouldn't show up, but it seems like they're they're good uh, good measuring stick for when you want to be awful. Yeah, yeah. We honestly, I'm not going to sugarcoat it in the slightest. We have been poor, and serious changes need to be made in order for us to make any sort of run in the playoffs. This you, mate. I know. I know you have to shoot off before uh, before too too long. What's kind of your main takeaway been this week? Is there anything that's troubled you, or anything for the Rockets, or is there anything that's made you sit up and take notice of somebody else? Um, yeah, it was actually um, two things. Rockets, obviously, because I watch the Rockets. Uh, two of my favorite players on the team, but more like AD. Like AD, I can't. Like AD's making me sick. AD's making me <laughs> fucking sick. AD's a disgrace, bro. Like, Speak on this. Speak on this. He's six foot eleven. What are you doing taking turnaround jumpers? Oh I don't understand God. it. You're not Dirk. You're not Dirk. <laughs> he can shoot. He can, he's got a decent stroke. You can hit an open jumper. You can hit a three. But when he's down low, you can't do anything. It's either a bucket or foul or both. And this guy's turnaround jumpers and, he's, and his lack of aggression just makes me sick. How are you scoring? And I had Lakers fans because I'm saying, I'll wake up the next day because some of the Lakers games are a bit late. Check the box score. I'm like, right, AD scored, AD scored eight points. He played 30 minutes. Like, what's going on? Did he get injured? <laughs> then it comes out of the foul. We wrapped up the first season. I'm like, no, this is what this guy can do. It doesn't make sense. You can't play for 30 minutes. One day, if you put up eight shots, you're playing for 30 minutes. And LeBron's not there. So, what, so what's going on? What? I don't, nah, it's just... It's, it's, Who's it's the first disgusting. option if, if LeBron's not there? It's you. You've got it's, to play like it. It's disgusting. You can't be as good as AD. And AD has always been in that top five, top three talk. Purely because of we're like, oh, look at AD. He could he got block shots. He could dribble. Definitely. No, we, yeah. we can't keep putting in the top five. Well, the thing the thing with AD is it's always been once he gets to a good team, once he has another star. And he's now there. I don't go wrong. He's putting up like what? He's putting up like what? Twenty seven and twelve. But he has them games where he'll drop nine. That's no nasty. I don't know. It's, just, it's disgusting. And if he does that nonsense in the playoffs, <laughs> Lakers, Lakers are gonna get bounced. They're gonna get bounced anyway. Um, for the Rockets, what's been interesting is. The sheer volume of threes, like, is <laughs> insane. And the thing is, people might see a box score thinking, what are the Rockets doing? These are wide open threes, bro. Yeah. Wide open threes. Teams are so petrified of Westbrook that they just clog the lane or try to clog, they try not to clog the lane. So that, okay, if we clog the lane, then all these men who can hit, like, Macklemore can hit, House can hit, Tucker can hit, Covens is all right, Green's all right, Gordon can hit. So, they, so it's either, okay, cool, we're going to clog the pay. Don't let, don't, don't let Westbrook and Harden come in. And then you have literally, when I say wide, sometimes, I think, what game was it? It was the Bucks game where I couldn't believe the three points and, and the Lakers game. Like sometimes, like, P.J. Tucker and, and Austin Rivers could literally go on a FaceTime, hit up their goals, oh, how's the kids? Da, 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 da. Okay, let me take this three. So they, like, I think the last game they hit against the Lakers, they hit, like, almost 60 threes. Um, against the uh, Trailblazers, 53 threes against the Bucks, 60 threes. And I just thought, and it brought me to think if they hit 36 or 37 percent of these threes, it might be impossible to beat them. But well, they're not on, 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 on the Rockets. Like, I know they play sort of five out, four out mm -hmm. a lot of the time. What do you put the ball movement down to? Obviously, the threats is part of it because you have to be wary of everybody because their percentages are solid and the looks they create are good. But how do they create such good looks compared to... Because even the Bucks, right? The Bucks create good looks, but a lot of that is just Giannis-based. He'll drive out to the paint. I, I, and then... I, think, I think a lot of it is, a lot of it is um, just Harden and Westbrook based. First of all, Harden is such a gifted passer, so even if you trap him, as soon as you trap him, he'll give up the ball. He's not going to try to do something silly. And then you've got literally people spread all across the floor. And also with Westbrook, Westbrook is very, very good at driving and kicking. So even if he gets the rim, um, you see it with like players like um, Curry as well and Lillard and all these other really great guys, and LeBron, that they will just do a mad pass of a mad different arm angles to find an open man. So when you've got, because Westbrook, you can't cover Westbrook 1v1. It's impossible. You can't cover hard 1v1. They keep trying, but they fail. Keep so, them. Yeah, so once the weak side, the strong side defender helps off, these players are so intelligent, they're such good passers that they kick out. So there's always open shots. So what I've seen teams and I've heard like um, analysis say that teams are now trying to think, okay, who are we going to give up the open three to? So you don't want to give up a corner three to PJ Tucker because he's well onto the bubble. He was shooting quite a high clip. Mm. House and Macklemore have come out of the bubble like Steph and Clay. I don't know what's going on. But if you're going <laughs> to give the open threes to 
Eric Gordon, who's been making me sick all year, is either <laughs> injured or shooting two from 75, or you're giving it to Austin Rivers or Jeff Green, then you might be able to, you think, okay, if these men hit five threes, then we deserve to lose. But you don't be giving an open three to Daniel House or Macklemore or Peter Tucker because they'll hit them all game. So I think a lot of it is like the Giannis thing, where you surrounded your trans and like trans um like generational player like, get into the basket with three point shooters. So it'll be interesting. So it's basically, it's literally just a math. It's, just, it's a math. It's a math quiz. Can these men hit 36, 37 percent from three? And if they do, then teams like the Lakers are going to struggle. But I think they'll struggle when it comes to the Clippers. Because Clippers can actually guard the perimeter. Yeah. That's what I was going to say. They, they just got so yeah, many yeah. guys you can switch on to everybody. That is... I know. And then, then it just becomes, oh, okay, Westbrook can't take us home. But teams like the Lakers, boy, if the Lakers give up... Barbecue, barbecue chicken, chicken, man. They, they might go home. Do you get me? They might go home. Yeah. So, Do you know yeah. what, though? I have to say, just on the back of what Dissy said, I have to give... I'm always... I'm quite critical of Mike D'Antoni and, and how, he's played, how he's played these teams in, post, in the postseason. This small ball, despite it not being so successful this year, oh, I, I can't even say that to be honest, because Capella left. Since since Capella's left, they've played, they've definitely looked they definitely look better. I think I have to give him plaudits, it, despite it being his last year, that he's 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 been a bit ballsy and he's he's been something, done something a bit different and he's actually he's actually paying off. He's 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 playing some good ball. I have to give him plaudits for it. I was critical of that. Uh, no, yeah, I'm not sure because you've got Westbrook and Harden. So, I, I don't know. I can't give... No, 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 you're right. You're right. But the thing is, I was more... But then he had Westbrook and... No, sorry. He had uh, Harden and um, Chris Paul. And obviously, and I believe uh, Russ is better than Chris Paul. But the way he was playing with, with Harden in the, in the playoffs last year, it was mad. Harden will miss 23s and, and they'll still be running the offense for him to shoot more threes. It's like, come on, dish the rock. But... I'm, I'm critical of him in that sense, so I have to give him plaudits for for the for the. Yeah, but I, I, I think I think so. Uh, Dan Tony, a lot of that's on Harden because if you watch, if you obviously you're never gonna watch all games, but if I'm telling you, if you watch Rockets with Harden and Chris Paul, when Chris Paul gets the ball, Harden's like, yeah, hurry up, man, so I can get the ball in the next possession. Like he just doesn't care. He's not making no cuts. He's not doing. He's not setting screens. He's literally standing there looking disinterested. So they they literally became a team where you're watching Harden do behind the back for behind the back three legged dribbles for 25 seconds, 24 seconds. <laughs> Guys, with this team, with Russ, I don't think he can get away with that with Russ because Russ just won't have it. Yeah. And so, like, now you're seeing Harden and Russ, it's more of a balanced attack. So the team is not completely Harden-centric because with Russ, Russ will kick it out as well. So now you've got two people that will actually kick the ball out. Whereas previously, when under D'Antoni, whether it was Dwight Howard or whether it was with Mikel or whether it's Chris Paul with D'Antoni, it was just literally, yeah, Harden's going to take um, a gazillion dribbles a game and then... Hopefully he wins for us. So yeah, I think he. Did, I'm not sure how much credit I'll give to D'Antoni. I'm not sure if that's Darren Murray. I'm not sure if that's Harden and Russ. But um, yeah, well, I'll give credit to D'Antoni in a postseason if he makes them adjustments in a playoff series. Mm-hmm. Right now, in a regular season, if you've got two MVP level players, you're going to slap teams up. It's just going to happen. I think. I think just obviously the headlines last year were AD and the young core going to the Pelicans from the Lakers, and obviously the Kawhi saga. But I think the the Westbrook Paul trade really got lost under a, a lot of that, and I think mm. it seems so simple. But when you have players as talented as Chris Paul, Russell Westbrook, James Harden, just that swap around and the chemistry change, going from two players who, by all accounts, despite what they said, did not get on, did not have a good vibe with each other, did not really complement each other on the court, to two players who have a massive mutual respect, have known each other for years are allegedly quite good friends, both good competitors. I think just that one swap could go down as, as trade of the summer if the Rockets go as far as they could. And it's, it's, it seems just, obviously, stylistically, it maybe helps now, but it just seems so built on chemistry and and um, being willing to do a bit for the other one that I think it's, it's made such a change that I really didn't expect, man. It's been amazing. Uh, Obi, mate, what's your big takeaway from the week? Apart from reading that article that I added you in where <laughs> all the Knicks fans have been watching Porzingis and, and crying a little bit. You're depressing me, man. You're giving me bad and, propaganda. I'm just kidding. And depressed. the Knicks passing on Michael, jo- um, Michael Jordan. Well, passing on Michael Porter Jr. as well. <laughs> oh, bro. It's just... Do you know, I don't want to talk about the Knicks, man. You're not getting right, We're talking about the bubble. The Knicks ain't even here. What's, 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 what's been your takeaway? What's been your big focus for the week? Cra- no, quickly now, I was cracking up the people who were um, talking about the pod last week and they were saying that they started laughing when they had us supported the Knicks. 
<laughs> it was like, it, I think it was like, they, they'd have forgiven you if it was sort of prime yes, mellow or something. Yeah. But they were like, 2016! <laughs> Wait, what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why? <laughs> this dude, did you know that lock in last week? No, I haven't locked in, dog. I don't know right, you Listen, did. listen, this dude, this is exact quote. <laughs> oh, Madison Square Garden, seemed pretty cool. Thought this must be a good team. <laughs> oh... What are you doing? Bro. <laughs> you just find yourself off for a life of misery, bro. Yeah. Having a life of misery. I like, I you guys the are the worst team. owner in the NBA as well. I love an underdog. You're the worst owner in the history of owners, bro. It's true, you know. Um, oh, God. But yeah, uh, what's that? My focus is the Pacers. Um, in particular, TJ Warren. So the Pacers have gone four That's and one around. in the bubble. Uh, they beat the Lakers yesterday. Yesterday? Yeah, yesterday. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, TJ Warren over the five games in the bubble has scored 53 points, 34 points, 32 points, 16 points, and yesterday 39 points. He's shooting 60% from the field, which is madness. I'm just thinking, like, what is going on? Um, I think he was averaging when he was at Phoenix, he was averaging like 18 points or something like that. And they traded him for a second round pick and cash considerations. <laughs> <laughs> just, to give, just to give listeners who aren't familiar with TJ Warren or even this, the reporter, Wodge, biggest ESPN NBA insider, big on Twitter. He only followed TJ Warren like last week. This is how much of a big deal this is. I can't see the events you might be interested in. Wodge only even cared about this guy last week. <laughs> you the vibes, man. That's, that's, these men are so fickle. It's terrible. <laughs> but the thing is, like, it's just, he's just shooting the lights out like consistently every night. I don't know how long this is going to last. I mean, it would be nice if it lasted up until the playoffs to make it interesting. But yeah, I've just been really surprised by how well you've been playing. Obviously, yeah, uh, you know, is there anything... I mean, the Pacers I kind of feared for when Sabonis went out of the bubble. Um, yeah. Wait, 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 wait. Guys, wait, wait, wait. The Pacers are above the Sixers, yeah? Yeah, fifth seed. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. I want to talk about Ben Simmons and Embiid for All-NBA. If I slap. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Well, do you know what? That Eastern Conference situation is an interesting one there, Obi, because you got um, Pacers and Miami both play each other uh, twice in the next week. So I, th- I think there's about two, three games between fourth, fifth and sixth in the Eastern Conference. Now, obviously, I've got a big interest because we're facing sixth in the, in the Boston Celtics. We're facing sixth. Um, yeah. Pacers are on the best form. Ben Simmons has gone out uh, with, a, with a knee surgery, potentially, that so... It might be time for the Sixers to just switch it up again. Uh, and again surround yeah. Embiid with shooters. We'll see what happens. But but the Pacers, <laughs> Pacers have looked a problem. Would you, out of curiosity, would you rather play Philly right now? Then, uh, you know I Philly, I just feel like are an annoying matchup for us this year. Mm. It all depends on what sort of health and, and uh, form Embiid's in going into it. Um, I think we're a better side than them. But I just if Embiid. I think Embiid could be the best player on the floor for four games or the most yeah. dominant because we yeah. don't have... We've got Ennis Cantor as our biggest centre and I'm not trusting him to defend anything. I mean, if Embiid does come under the pain, maybe, OK, cool, under the rim. But um, I think... Listen, we swept the Pacers last year, 4-0. Um, 4-0, sorry, let's Americanize it. Miami have shown they're a bit of an awkward fit for us as well. Mm. Um, I'd like the Sixers just for the tense... tense Tense rivalry that's been going over the last three years or, or so has revived itself, but mm. yeah, I don't know. Celtics, I'm just unsure of. I, I'd probably take the Pacers out of them if I could choose, but Perfect. we'll see. That's the thing because you don't, you have to gamble and think that this TJ Warren form is not going to last. <laughs> no, nah, well, it's just like it might be a hot streak. For a few years now, have been a great regular season team, yeah, um, because they work hard, they are a hard working group, coach is good. Um, Oladipo's back now as well. How's he look? That's, about, that's about to ask. That's exactly about to ask. How's he look? He's been okay. Like I don't think he's been uh, fantastic. I only watched. I watched two of the games in full, and I thought he was. Pre- I thought he was pretty good, considering coming back from how long injury. I don't know how long he was out for. Like, like long a, enough. Yeah. 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 So it'd be good for him to get that ribbon back before the playoffs come about. Yeah, he had a good game yesterday, right? was... Stay good. He had a good game yesterday. Yeah. Yeah, to be, I haven't watched ready, that game. I, guess, I haven't watched that game back, so it's the question. I wouldn't know. Playoff ready. Um, That's the thing. But yeah, any anything else that would be from your main takeaways apart from the Warren Bonanza? Um, Luka Doncic is doing a madness. That's all yes. I've got. 
28, well, the, <laughs> his, his numbers over the past five games, 28, 13 and 10, 48 and 11, 34, 20 and 12, 29, 3 and 6. And then yesterday, 36, 14 and 19. And they beat them. They beat the Bucks. That's a white Russell Westbrook. He's a stat padder, man. Mm. <laughs> and I think it's, it's another one of those... Um, one of the most meaningless stats. He was like the youngest player to get 34, 14, and 19. I know. Yeah, I hate that abomination. I hate those stats. No one give me those ESPN stats. I'm, 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 I'm at task OB every week with coming in with <laughs> stats that's going to piss everyone off. <laughs> the most bespoke oh stat you can find. The best bespoke stat I heard, I put it on the Twitter, is Bobo is the tallest ever Denver Nugget to score a three pointer. So that, that was important to know. <laughs> Man will be like, this is the first time since Wilt in 1973 that somebody <laughs> had Pepsi before a game of football. <laughs> Shut up! Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's so jarring. That's so yeah. weird. Knee, oh, mate. Knee. Yeah. Last but not least, what have your big sort of courtside focuses been for this week? And my focus has been the Clippers. So um, they've been free two since the restart. And you know how last week I was talking about their chemistry being the biggest issue, probably. Mm. Um, so they played the Suns in the week. It was a good one. Um, it was a good win for the Suns that game. But I was watching the game back, and I watched the game. And um, just like defensively, um, like like the two stars in Kawhi and PG, like um, they were just getting confused, and like and they weren't organized well. Like and the chemistry just seems off. Like um, so there'd be a pick and roll, there'd be like a high screen, and like they'll just be confusing between Kawhi and PG. Like I'm near them, pick up Booker, and then Booker will get the open three. And the team in general. Um, they're not covering screens well. I think it was a really poor game on defensively. But like because of the, the star power they got on all the like, ammunition off the bench, they only lost the game by two and took it down to the wild. But I mean, I mean they just look like a team. And even that, that Booker shot to win it, by the way. That, yeah, it was nuts. Yeah, yeah was that, that was the world defended play. It was a great offense. He's you can't do anything about that. Jumper off balance, three people yeah. near him. Of those three, I think it's Kawhi, Paul George, and maybe even Bevin. I don't know. But... Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's, there's nothing you can do about that. But yeah, wow. it's it a great offensive play. But I mean, like, um, the Clippers at like, this year, like, they just look like um, they're taking it easy. Like, they've won the championship already. Like, they look like the Warriors did like, um, like, um, last year, basically. And they look like they're seasoned vets who are just going to turn it up when the playoff comes. But I mean, I'm the only person that's really done that in the past. I miss Kawhi. I don't see any evidence of that really from PG in recent years. Sure. Um, and then you've got Patrick Beverly out here talking to Dane. That he's a big man. That he's gonna do something and pull up numbers in the postseason. Oh, I, I, I hate that, you man. I can't stand <laughs> it. I, can't, yeah. I, can't, I can't believe he's talking to Dame Lillard. I can't. And he's it's like the video. Yeah. He was on JJ Reddick's podcast. Mm. He basically said, "Oh, Dame Lillard's probably his toughest matchup. It made him want to go to the weight room. It made him want to get faster. It made him want to change his trainer." And to reach, no, I'm sorry. As Westbrook said, he tricked y'all. He running around, yeah. <laughs> running around the pack, doing night and before. I hate him. But yeah, I can, never, I can never decide where I stand on on Pat Bev, man. Like the way he had to come into the league, playing where he played. Yeah, you got to respect his hustle. Yeah, he's elite. He's elite. And and, and and just like his his own backstory is crazy. I think he did an amazing podcast with Wodge like three years ago. He was amazing. But then you do see things where you're just like, nah, you're jarring me, man. You're yeah, jarring me now. His mouth is too big. I mean, it's the sort of play you, like, I mean, you love to have in your team, but like you'd hate to play against. Yeah, see, the thing is, the thing is, yeah, I'm not even mad at Pat Bev trying all this, yeah, because that's Pat Bev. Paul George. <laughs> yeah, listen, Paul George, you need to stay calm. No, you, for bro, no, for you need to stay calm. I, Paul can't, George. I can't believe Paul George. If, the last thing we remember of Paul George is Dane Miller really doing this to him? Eli, exactly. just saying bye. Just do that. Just saying goodbye. Listen. Uh, uh, Dane cooked him, though. He's like, yeah, you're out here footing and bopping for different teams trying to find a chip. No. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> running away, running away, trying to find a fit. Yeah. No, Listen, no. when... George Paul... Paul George needs to, needs to reel it in a little bit because, yeah, man, it's... And that's what I'm saying about the Clippers. Like, I mean, they're just walking around. Like, I'm playing the regular season. Like, they've got this sorted and like, they're going to the playoffs and like, flip the switch. And I don't think that's the case. Like, I mean, you can't really do that. I mean, my opinion like, as a team, especially this teams that are pretty new and like, they haven't really built that chemistry yet or had a championship run. So, I mean, and that would be their biggest concern for me. And like, I'm the Lakers, and they have their faults, but they played pretty hard the whole season. And like, they really had their emphasis on working defensively as a team, yeah. playing defensively as a team. So, like, if it came down to a seven series, 
it might be that sort of thing that will just edge it for them if the Clippers aren't hitting the ball well. I think, I think you make a really interesting point in that different approaches there. On the one hand, you've got Clippers who have load managed Kawhi a lot, obviously, yeah. and obviously had to look after George coming in with a shoulder injury and have sort of jogged their way to the playoffs in the hope of, of being fresh for it. And then the Lakers, mm. the argument might be that they're not so fresh now um, as a result of playing so hard all through the season. So, so it's an interesting one. I think just if we were to call it now, obviously we've got a playoff preview next week, but if we were to call it now, Nii, do you see the Clippers as potentially sleepwalking into the playoffs and getting a bit of a shock? Or do you think they're, they're, they're good, but they need to just watch it, but they should win out and, and get to the Eastern Conference Finals, as, as we predict? And they should get to the finals because I think the first round matchup would be um, the Mavs, who I think they're like, um, steamroll. Well, I, I think they're the fagging series. Saw last night, if, if Porzingis, Doncic show up like they can, if Seth gets on fire, they, they're a problem, the Mavs. They're, their defence is not good. but No, their defence is trash and that's where they yeah. lose the game, I think, yeah. yeah. I think yeah, I think I think, think there's more. Game series. Yeah, there's too many ifs. There's too many caveats for Mavs to cause any problems. I think I think Clips 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 see it past them for sure. Like that kind of performance we saw from from um, Luca in in the clutch yesterday. It's not it's not as often. It's not as frequent as we, as we've seen from Kawhi in in short. And and Kawhi has that defensive prowess that mm. he's that he's best known for. It's I I only see one way that series going. I'm not gonna lie, man. Well, cool. Just to round up, boys. Um, wait, wait, wait. We have to shout out. We have to shout out for. Well, I'm Booker. Booker, have to shout. Yeah, this do, is it. Just do. to He's round out. Me. Just to round out. I was gonna say anything we haven't touched on that you think just deserves a mention that people need to go and clock on YouTube. People who are waiting for the playoffs to start official might have missed. And yeah, Booker's been unreal. Yes, yeah, so I, I, I was actually gonna speak on them a little bit. I was just gonna speak on them. Basically, said so last week. And, I mean, it wasn't just me, but like, practically no one gave the Suns a chance of making the playoffs or even, <laughs> or even like, I'm contending. And, like, to everyone's surprise, they've gone 5 and on in the bubble so far. And, like, and they look good. Like, I mean, look at Aiton. He's even, like, I mean, he stretched his game a little bit. Like, he's coming to the three-point line and hitting down a couple of threes. I mean, it's not a, a high clip, but, I mean, it's still something that you'd want from your big man, especially in the modern NBA. Um, You've got Ricky Rubio, he continues to, like, play well and like, facilitate and he's hitting his jumpers. I mean, he's not, like, I'm hesitating. So, um, yeah, I mean, the Suns look good. Um, I don't think they'll make the playoffs still, but I mean... Well, it's an um, interesting one, though. If form carries on how it is, it, it looks like it could be yeah, a potentially, yeah. Phoenix Blazers play-in, um, which could be really interesting. You, that would be really interesting, yet. yeah. Very interesting. It, it, oh. even, um, even Booker went zero from seven from the three-point yesterday. They, they still got the win. Mm. That's the thing about him because he's a skill scorer. Yeah, yeah, I think I, I think he's excellent, man. And that's the difference between like him and someone like Tatum. I mean, um, like when it's not really going for him, like his shots, um, Booker will go to the line. Like, I mean, he will hit the twos. Um, like, um, he's good enough to get the mid range shot off. Like, I mean, he knows his spots, and he will get to the line and hit more free throws. So, um, yeah, man, they got a really skilled player in Devon Booker. But um, I may just need a few more pieces. I'm not really too sure. Yeah, yeah, I think I think we we touched on them. I'll let you go, Obi, in a sec. We touched on them in the profile of just they they're promising and no one really gave them a chance for anything this year no. and it's been a really nice surprise with Aiden with Booker Rubio is a nice experienced hand to to enable Booker to play the game that he wants to and like we said like these are uh, we said it in the group chat that the Wizards have shown up here and not only have they just not had a chance of progressing they've actually regressed in the standings <laughs> below the Charlotte Hornets because of how badly they've done here but they don't get a lottery ticket to go with that now so like the Suns not only are they getting to get this postseason experience potentially or almost semi postseason experience they still keep what I believe is a lottery pick um, so they could get another nice piece to put with Booker to put with mm. Aiton um, oh, yeah, it's, 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 it's good Obi saying, what were you going to yeah so what you were saying about getting another piece do you think Lamelo Ball would be a good fit on the Suns? Um, oh I man! Interesting. I haven't seen enough of him in Australia. In yeah, same playing senior, but he seems to be a, a sort of a default top three pick. Yeah, yeah, he's like, definitely a top three pick. He's a good Anything like Lonzo in terms of being a facilitator. Yeah, exactly. Um, but just his timeline matching better than Rubio and and, yeah. 
those, and those sort of guys. I think it would be really, really interesting. I think Lamelo would be a good fit, but I think they might just need someone else to help. Them yeah, a bit of experience to lock things up. Yeah, and actually, like lead the team. Booker for me, just because mm. like like his usage rate is just ridiculous of how yeah. many attacks have to go through him. Mm. Um, and I think as you've seen with like Celtics. If you have a team that has to worry about Haywood and Brown and Tatum and Kemba at any one time potentially, um, it can really help in terms of just yeah yeah Take the like pressure off. even more effective. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think Lamelo is a good shout for them. A good mm. shout. It depends how high they get, obviously, because they're That's not the going to be. They're probably unless they get a really nice lottery um, win basically and shoot up in the odds they probably won't get near to Lamelo just because yeah. of how highly touted he is but um I think there's a load of players in there we'll probably do a draft pod um closer to closer to draft time but I think there's a load of players in there that could could really kick the thumbs on and it's between them and the Grizzlies and rebuilding Spurs and there's a lot of and then even Minnesota if they can get someone to join uh Carl Anthony Towns and D'Angelo yeah. Russell. You'll have a lot yeah, of yeah, yeah. really Devin Booker even. young size. That'd be a great trio. Oh, that'd be beautiful to watch. Really yeah, lovely if, tandem. If they could trade for him, but yeah. We'll wrap it there for this week. Um, obviously, same again. Great to chat. Great to sit down. Great to look back on the week. I think it's good for something as fast moving as the NBA to just have this Sunday morning afternoon where we can just take stock of everything that's happened and and look forward to next week. As I've said, next week will probably be. All in on the playoffs. We'll be aware of all of the matchups. We'll be aware of, of who is going to look to struggle and who is going to excel against who. Um, really looking forward to it. The bubble has exceeded my own expectations. So uh, it's been good. Great a lot of tight games as well. So, um, so yeah, I'll see you all next week, same time. Um, thanks everybody for listening. This has been Courtside Fracas, and we will see you next week, next Sunday. Peace. Peace.